Acts 3, verse 1 to 8. One day Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the, temp into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Yeah, I think I would too. I think I would too. I want to talk to you today uh, about a message that's titled, What Do You Have? What do you have? What do you have? Silver and gold they didn't have, but what they did have, they gave to him. This man had been sitting there, it says he was lame his whole life, so he had been sitting there probably, who knows, since he was 17, 18, 19, 20. They just kept bringing him to the temple gates and said he had been there for a long time, which, which is kind of interesting. And, and this man, we know from the next chapter, he was actually 40 years old. So he had been sitting there. They would bring him every single day to the temple gates. People would, would give him money, hopefully, and he would just beg. And what's interesting about this is that how many times would be my question, how many times did Jesus actually walk past this guy and he didn't heal him? Sometimes God will leave things for you and I to do. Maybe Jesus along the way had given him some money before. Maybe Jesus just said, bless you. Maybe Jesus taught the disciples that give to those who are poor and he showed him how to do that, but he never raised this man up. He waited for Peter and John to do that later on. What they gave him far outweighed the money. Money isn't always the answer. I know we tend to think it is, but I sure would rather have peace in my life than a whole bunch of money in my pocket. I would, know where I, I, would, I would rather know where I'm going when I do perish because it is appointed unto man, unto man once to die, the Bible says. And after that, the judgment. So you need to know where you're going. And so I'd rather be saved. I'd rather have a lot of things other than money. And this guy just thought that I just need money. I just need money. I can't work. I need money. Give me money. But they saw that he needed something far more than that. Um, this past Tuesday, I had a really crazy experience. And I, I'm just assuming that, that um, God set me up for this message. And, uh, and I'm glad that he did. Um, Pastor Steve and I, we, we had a meeting. Tina couldn't be there. And so we, we met at McDonald's. And as we were sitting at McDonald's on Tuesday this past week, there was a guy that came in. I could see the counter. Steve was here and I could see the counter. And um, I heard somebody, I heard somebody say, well, God bless you. I thought well, that, that was interesting. And I looked up and I, I saw a guy and kind of walked this way and he came back and then he, he sat down in a booth, about two or three booths uh, behind us, but he was crying. He had his hands on his face like that, just kind of rubbing them. And, but it wasn't that much longer. And all of a sudden he got back up again and he grabbed the bag and, and he went out the door. So I thought, you know, maybe he was just waiting for his food or I, I wasn't sure what was going on. I thought maybe, maybe somebody had just bought his food you know, that I, I don't know. I, I wasn't sure what was happening. And, but he left. And I was like, that was interesting. And I, I even told Steve, I said that the guy back there was crying. I'm not sure what's, what's going on. And so our, our meeting got finished. And um, Steve had to, you know, go to the other room. And so as, as he was uh, not with me anymore, um, I, was, I was leaving. And so as I'm, as I'm walking out the door, immediately... There's the same guy again, and he's coming in, and he's still crying. And so I stopped, and I said, are you okay? And he said, no, not really. He said, I'm, I'm about to lose my house, and I've got nothing. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, 
I said, I'm sorry about that. Can I, can I pray with you? And he said, yeah. And it's amazing. He held out his hand. I mean, before I did, he held out his hand like this. And he said, I'm actually an ordained minister. Now, here's the thing. I don't know what was in his life, but he, he was ordained through one of the magazines, you know, in the back. And maybe he helped somebody at some point get married. I'm, I'm not sure why he did that. Maybe he had some kind of, I don't, I don't really know, but he felt bold enough to actually tell me that. But he held out his hand and he's all tatted up. His fingernails have polish on them, black polish. And um, you knew that he had been living life on his own for a long time, separate from God. And, uh, and he, was, he was down about as low as you can go. And that day, I didn't have silver and gold to give him. He even told me, he said, here's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm actually, I'm doing DoorDash. I'm just doing what I can. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to keep my house, but $700 every two weeks, that's not, that's not enough to, to do it. And I certainly didn't have, I had no cash on me and I didn't have enough money to help him out of a situation like that anyway. But what I did do is I saw him that day. I saw his pain and I stopped and I was able to just minister to him. And, and I, I took it one step just a little further. He had, he had mentioned, yeah, all I've got is my, my dog and my car. And he, his car was over there and his dog was in the car. And I just went over and, and, and we both just kind of went over. We we're looking at his dog and I, I said, can I pet him? Because he didn't, he was one of those dogs. It's like, he looks nice, but I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> and um, um, yeah, beautiful dog, though. And, and so we just talked for a minute. And he said, well, listen, I've, I've got to get going because I've got I to do the DoorDash thing. I've got to get this delivery made. He said, I'm actually one of the best in the area. You can look me up. I'm one of the best, you know. And, <laughs> and uh, I think he's doing all he can to keep his house. But all I know is that I did my part that day. And sometimes that's all we've got to do. Sometimes that's all that you're supposed to do is just do your part. See somebody, see where they're at, give a smile, give some attention to them. Maybe, maybe share a scripture with somebody. I don't know how many times I've done that. Um, I'll just email somebody. I'll text it to somebody and just say, here's a scripture. And it like fits right there because I was just trying to listen to God and God stirred my heart to send it to them. And so I did. And out of obedience, see, that's always the key. It's, it's obedience. We're so many simple things that we can do. I mean, there's, there's many men in here that, that you can patch somebody's hole in their wall. You can patch a deck. You can patch some stairs and nobody else is going to do it. And that person maybe is unable to, or maybe they're elderly and, and they just need somebody to come alongside and just say, can I help you with that? Can I, can I do that? And, and many of you can do that. Ladies and, and some of you guys, you guys can cook. You can bless somebody. You can give a meal to somebody. You can, and for no reason sometimes. Maybe there doesn't need to be a reason. Hey, I just want to let you know that tonight I'm bringing dinner over. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, no. No, I'm bringing it over. I just want to bless you. Well, okay, but what about? No, 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 no nothing. I've got everything. And everything's going to be there. And some of you can do things like that. Some of you uh, can cut, cut somebody's grass. Maybe winter's coming, unfortunately. But winter's coming, and maybe you can shovel somebody's driveway. If you're paying attention, if you're listening, if you're watching, opportunities are right in front of all of us. They always are. And instead of just kind of grumbling about this person or that person, or they didn't look very nice, I can't believe I, I went into that store and the greeter just kind of didn't even look at me. Instead of just worrying about that, what if you walked up to the greeter and just said, good morning. I hope you have a great day. I mean, we just got to go out of our way. And I don't know what God would have you do, but we've all got something that we can give to somebody else. It may not be silver and gold, but what you do have, could you give it to them? And so the question obviously today is, what do you have? What do you have? Many of us who are born again have the spirit of God on the inside of them. Let me just tell you, that's all you need. We don't need anything more. Follow the spirit. Listen to him. Because he'll tell you what that person needs. He'll tell you what you can give, what you need to do, how you need to. Let me, let me give you one other thing that you can do. Some of you need to give freedom to somebody else by releasing them, by giving them grace and mercy for what they did to you in the past. Maybe you need to tell them that. Maybe you're the one that needs to say, I'm sorry. Maybe you can give them that. That's a gift, believe me. So don't hoard what God has given you. Don't hoard what he's given and stop being afraid. Listen, I, I lived part of my life this way because I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up poor. 
but I didn't grow up wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. We always just had enough. We lived paycheck to paycheck. Thank God there was a paycheck most of the time. There were times that it got very, very tight for my parents. But I just know that we grew up paycheck to paycheck. And that instilled in me in my early age this idea that I need to keep what I've got. Don't, don't let it go. You know, and so I, I wasn't very good at giving. And I'm just now getting better at that in my life over the last number of years. Tina is much better at that, at just naturally being a giver. And I have to, I have to, I've had to practice that. But I'm getting it now, and it's much more fun on that side. I, I like giving. It's, it's, it's way more fun than being a, a hoarder because here's what happens. You're actually afraid of the future when you're a hoarder. When, when, you're, when you're holding on to your finances, when you're holding on to your things. You know, I've had guys, and this, this kind of blows me away. I've had guys, and who, how many of you know that pickup trucks are like forty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000? I've had guys tell me in this church, I've had a couple of guys actually, and they didn't know each other. Hey, well, they might know each other, but, but they didn't know that each other was doing it. Hey, if you ever need to borrow my truck, you can borrow it. I took somebody up on that. Sure enough, no problem. Come on over, get it. Well, I'm going to be trying. It, it don't matter. No big deal. Okay, well, I'll put gas in it. No, don't, don't even worry about that. What? It's just, what do you have? What do you have that somebody else can use? What do you have? Luke 6.38 reminds us to be faithful of what we do have because more will be given. It says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured out into your lap. Picture that. that we always read that so fast. A good measure pressed down. I always like to think of um, um, brown sugar. Thank you. A brown sugar in a, in a one, one cup brown sugar. <laughs> pressed down shaken together. You want to make sure you get it all in there and then heap it on there. Let it just run over. And it'll be, as you give, it'll be poured out into your lap in the same way. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I found that to be true. I found that the more that I give, the more comes back. It, it might look different. Yeah, it may look very different. But it doesn't matter because God knows what I need. I just help them with what they needed. And all of a sudden, God helps me with whatever I need. He'll have mercy on somebody else. will just say, man, can I give you this? Can I do this? You know, when, when Tina and I started this church, um, to say money was tight would be an understatement. And so we, we really had nothing. Everything that we had, we were pouring into the church or we just kind of had used it all up. And, and we had really nothing, very, very little. And uh, there was a, a couple here that often times, I mean, oftentimes, would give us $50 cards. Don't make me cry. $50 cards to go out to eat. And I told them one time, because to them, it was probably just, oh, you know, we just love you guys, and we just want to bless you. Here you go. To them, it was probably not a big deal. But for us in that time, it made, it made Tina and I feel like we could go out to eat and enjoy some things of life that we just would not have been able to otherwise. And it was a big deal to us. It, it made us feel even kind of like, I don't know, a little more normal. You know, we, we got to go out. We got to do some things that, that other people are doing. And um, that was a strong blessing in our life. And I, I don't know that they ever fully understood that, but, but it was a real blessing. Let me read you another story. This is out of Matthew 25. Start at verse 14. It's kind of long, but hang with me here. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one who had two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, 
Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has been given more, for whoever uh, has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. He's not saying that if you have very little that he's going to take what little bit you do have and give it to somebody else. He's saying, take what you've got and begin to invest it. Begin to use it in the kingdom of God. And when you do, when you've been faithful with that little bit, I'm going to give you more. I believe this. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I, look at, I look at all of us, especially, I, I just want to say, it's not, not to discount anybody who's newer, let's just say in the, in the last few months to our church, but I look at those who helped us start out and plant this church. We didn't have anything. There were things that we borrowed. We, we didn't borrow any money, but we needed different things like, like walls for kids areas because we were setting up in a gymnasium and setting up in a cafeteria and we put up walls and, and we had to borrow those walls from, from a, our, our network that helped us plant, Reach Missouri Network. And, and they had some um, uh, pipe and drape that we, that we put up to create a better atmosphere in certain areas and, and all these different things, a stage. We had to borrow a stage because we were just on a gym floor and, and we did with what we could. And I remember one of the first things as people started to give, we, we had like $600. And so we bought a printer. That was one of the first things that this church has ever owned. It's still, it's still at my house and it still works. Praise God. And, uh, and we use it all the time. It's at my house because my office is at the house. You want you to think I stole it. <laughs> <laughs> and so we still use that to this day. But from that seed and being faithful with what we've been given, God has prospered us just in three and a half years to suddenly now have 10 acres of property, to have a building, to have chairs, to have a stage, to have a sound system, to have lights and, and do all these things. And that is a miracle of God. That is, there's no other answer for that. I know it wasn't myself and I know it wasn't Tina. It wasn't even us together. It was in many ways, all of us together, but it was God supernaturally seeing they've, they've got it. They're doing it right here. I'm just going to give them some more. Well done. Way to go. Here's some more. And he just kept prospering. And I believe that as we continue to do things right, God will just continue to prosper us as well as, as your own family, as well as your own life. As you do the right things with what God has given you, you'll prosper. And I don't know if you've seen, but when you don't do the right things. It does seem like you're constantly like, where'd my money go? Where'd, where'd everything go? I can't, I can't pay the bill. What's that? I'm making $50,000 a year. Why can't I pay my bills? And you're wondering where it goes and just saying, maybe it's because you haven't been faithful with what God has given you. We're called to bless others. We're not called to hoard. We're not called to live our life fearful of what's coming. He, he actually says that, that uh, worry about today because tomorrow has enough problems of its own. Just, just do today. Um, I, I just told somebody recently, and this, this, is, this works with money, this works with anything you have, but I, I just told somebody uh, the other night, I, I said, uh, you know, one thing I've learned is, because I was really, a, I was kind of afraid of when we first started, I wasn't kind of, I was very afraid. When we first started, I didn't, I didn't think I could do two messages in a row. I had never preached two messages like, like that Sunday and then the next Sunday. I don't, I don't know. I may have done that only once in my life, and I had to work my tail off to be able to do that at the time. And I said, God, I, I don't know if I could do this. And that was part of maybe why the church delayed in getting started, because I wasn't trusting God. I was trusting myself, which there's not much there to, to trust. And so um, I... I uh, I've learned this, though, over the last number of years. God will give me um, a topic, and I'll think, man, that'll be really great. Let's just say, let's just say for Easter. Boy, I, I want to keep that message over here for Easter. 
And yet I sense that God's telling me to do it now. And I'm thinking, yeah, but that would be really great for Easter. But I've learned something. I've learned, give what he's given to you right here and now. And as you give it out, more comes back. And so every week, whenever I need to preach, sometimes Tina's up here, but whenever I'm preaching, God just pours it out that week. Just something new, something new, something new. Here it is, here it is. And I don't have to worry about, I don't know if I've got enough. I don't know, God, I don't know. And I'm just telling you, whatever area of your life that you're holding back from God or that you're fearful about, that you're kind of hoarding, and it doesn't mean that you've got a lot of it. Sometimes we hoard just a little bit. It's funny, we get, we get really weird about that. Like, that's all I got. And sometimes the less we have, the less we're willing to give. And you may be waiting, well, when I get more, I'll give. When I get more, I'll give. You know, statistically, those who are wealthy give less than those who have little. When you, when you look at the percentages, those who have less actually give more. So if, if you look at the tithe, which, which I know in many ways that's an Old Testament teaching, and, and uh, so I just believe now that if, if you believe that the tithe is for the Old Testament, um, no problem whatsoever. I, I honestly believe that it probably is, but here's the thing. If it was 10% in the Old Testament, how much more should it be in the New Testament that we give? And so, because grace has been poured out to us, man, we should be living out of abundance and just, and just giving everywhere that we possibly can. And I'm just telling you, the secret is that when you give, God will give back to you pressed down, shaken together, running over. It'll be added back to your life. Can I get a yeah? <laughs> Where was Steve at? I heard that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. I'll just throw this out there. It's just a great reminder. If you're on our serve teams, you guys already know this. If you've been with us very long, you already know this. Excellence isn't doing things perfectly. Excellence isn't doing things the way that the other church does it, that big church, the one that you're like, wow, or that big company or that, that other, the neighbor's house that's so big. That, that's not excellence. Excellence is doing the very best with what God has given you. That's all. That's all. See, we all have different levels. Some people are in here have far more resources than, than I've got, and some people have far less than what you've got. But as, a, as, it's, as it has been given out to you, you give. You be faithful with, you, with what you've been given. You see, the one had five and he was faithful with it. God said, well done, well done. The other one only had two, but he was faithful with it. And, and this master said the same thing, well done, you did good. But the one guy did nothing with it, nothing with it. And he took it away from him. Because when we're unfaithful, then, you know, it, you may think that God's hard, but you would do the same thing. If you had three people standing in front of you and said, man, you guys, you guys I'm going to give you money and I want you to invest in it and, and just make this thing go. And the other, and this last guy doesn't do anything with it. You take it away. Do you give it to somebody else too? You would do the same thing. It's a simple principle. It's a simple principle, but it's a spiritual principle as well. So what do you have? What do you have? And here, here's what I want to, I want to give you a very, very simple equation today. Little plus faith equals enough. Little plus faith equals enough. You've got enough. You've got enough. You've got enough. Look at this story, 2 Kings 4, 1 to 7. This one's powerful. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha. Now that may sound strange to you, company of the prophets. So just think of it, there's a, a group of prophets. There's a group of prophets. She's the wife of one of those prophets. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband is dead and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around uh, I'm sorry, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and you and your sons. Pour oil into all the, jar, into all the jars. And as each is filled, put it one aside. She left him and shut the door behind her and, and her sons. Uh, they brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. He replied, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell all the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. 
In this story, it's interesting because this widow first said, I don't have anything. When he said, what do you have? I don't, I don't have anything. And then probably she thought, well, I've got this jar and this oil. But in her mind, she had nothing. And Elisha was saying, what do you have? There has to be something. What do you have? What, what do you have that, that, that I can use? What do you have that God can use to prosper you? What do you have? And the, the widow obeyed Elisha, and she went and did what he said. And here's something interesting. When she got all those vessels, it's an interesting thing. You got to look at the little things in these stories. He told her, when you get all the vessels, go to all your neighbors, get, get all the vessels, and, and don't get just a couple. He said, get, get as many as possible. Get as many as possible. When you get them all, I want you to go into your house and then shut the door behind you. There are many times that Jesus, before he healed somebody, would tell everybody, you need to get out of the room. Because you don't need the naysayers. You don't need the people who are saying, oh, he can't do that. Well, that's not going to happen. Well, I, I know he said that, but, but as you start pouring, watch, this is going to end up with one. And then you start believing it. And sure enough, it only ended with one because you didn't believe God. You believed the naysayers. You believed the enemy. And so some of us got to shut that door and stop listening to the naysayers. Stop listening to all the people saying, you can't do that. That can't happen. You, you, can't, you can't run a service like this. You can't allow the Holy Spirit to move in your service. You can't pray for the sick and see them healed. You're not gonna, that's, not, that's crazy stuff. That's not even for today. That was all back then. It's all passed away. Well, then why are people being healed in our church? Because that's what we're seeing. We're seeing people get healed. We're seeing lives be restored. We're seeing lives changed. Because we're stepping out in faith and we're deciding to follow after God instead of what all the other people are doing or what all the other people are saying. We're following after God. And to be quite honest, I don't care about all the church growth techniques. I don't care if this church gets really big. I want this church on fire. I want this church to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I don't want anybody, anybody who walks in these doors to be lulled asleep and go to hell. They've been in church, they're there every Sunday, but their life hasn't changed. No gospel of the blood of Jesus Christ is shared. Just a gospel that motivates people to feel a little bit better about your life. Feel a little bit better about where you are. The gospel is real truth. And it should bring a change in your life. And it causes you into action. It causes you to seek a living God who forgives you of your sins. It, it causes you to humble your heart. And to realize who you are. I, I, I say it this way. There's no doubt. It's even biblical. Jesus is our friend. He calls us his friend. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. But at the same time, I always say, don't forget to have the fear of that friend. Because that's the same guy that can take your life as well. He can take your soul. Man can take your life, so to speak. He's the one that can take your soul. And so he's my best friend. But at the same time, I know who he is. It's like a relationship with a really good dad. A really good father. You, you know that, that he loves you, he takes care of you, he provides for you, he takes you to the games, he hangs out with you, he buys you ice cream. I mean, he's a great dad, but he's still dad. He's the one that brought you in the world, he's the one that can take you out of the world. And so that's, just, that's, that's how we look at God. I look at God in that way. I say, God, I love you, you're my friend, but I also fear you at the same time. I know who you are. And fear doesn't have to be this weird thing, it's, it's honor. I honor you, God, for who you are. I do realize that, that I need to respect you and honor you for who you are. And, and that's, that's all that the fear of the Lord is. And so the question has to be today, what do you have? What do you have? It was just this morning, as Tina just got out of bed, I began to tell her about a scripture. And she said, it's a little early for this. <laughs> but I had already been up for like an hour and a half. And I'm looking over my notes and I'm looking over this message. And it's always scary on Sunday mornings because then God starts to speak to you. And I'm like, oh my goodness, God, I've already got my notes. And so I've got to go change my notes and everything. Because this scripture came to my heart. And this is what I started to share with her. You guys all know the, the scripture about the, the mustard seed. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, that's what the NIV says. And I don't want to, 
I like the NIV. We just read a lot of stuff out of the NIV. I'm, I'm, I'm one that uses all kinds of translations. I'll, I'll, I'll read them and, and see what's, what's happening there. There's a couple that I base much of what I read off of so that if it's way off, I'm like, wait a minute, that, that's, that's not right. But the NIV says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, I started thinking, wait, that, that sounds really strange because the very first verse, it says something like this, and you could put that up there, uh, Matthew 17, verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said, because of your little faith. Now, if you stop right there, he just said, because of your little faith, and that's in the NIV also. It says little faith, but then he says, but if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, and I'm thinking, that doesn't make any sense. You just condemn them, so to speak told him why it wasn't working because you had small faith. And now you're saying if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. And actually, if you look at the ESV and the other trend, New King James Version has it this way. It says, be, it says, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith. For truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. If you have faith like a mustard seed, what, what faith does a mustard seed have? Mustard seed, as you guys know, is this tiny, tiny little seed. I mean, it's, it's as small as some of my bird seed. It's really tiny. It's this little thing, but that little seed has incredible faith, actually. So it's not have faith as small had that little faith as small as a mustard seed. You need to have incredible faith, even though you're a mustard seed. You you are small, and you feel like you can't. You don't have what it takes. You don't have enough. You don't have all the resources. You don't know how to do this. You're not sure how to how to get this done. How am I going to meet this need over here? How am I going to pay this bill? And God says, "Have faith like a mustard seed. A mustard seed's tiny, but look at the faith that it has. It grows and it grows and it grows and it just keeps compounding. And as it grows, I give it more water and more sun, and it grows even bigger." It just keeps going. And that is what that story is all about. It's not to have tiny faith. If you just have a little faith, God. No, that's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, though you're small, though you're small, have big faith. Believe for amazing things. Believe in what I can do in your life. Believe that what you have is enough, that whatever you've got in your house, it'll meet all the needs that you need. There's a lot of different stories out there. One, one of the stories I'll tell you real quick is... Uh, Everybody heard of the, of the, the I, guess, I guess you'd call it a box store now, I don't know, Ikea. We've all probably bought some furniture there. You know that it's like a furniture store. They sell some other things. But um, Ikea started in Sweden by this, by this guy's name that I, I can't remember, and it's very difficult to pronounce. Um, I'm not even going to try because I, I, I could if I had it in front of me. This guy started this business when he was 17. He was in a little village in Sweden little village. And it's very difficult to get around. It says that the terrain there was very difficult to move around. And, uh, but what he did is he was in need, so to speak, at 17. His family didn't have a lot. And he just began to sell things like household items. So it mentioned things like wallets and pens and, and who knows, little trinkets that you had around your house. And he would go around and he would sell those to neighbors just trying to make some money. Well, he realized that He's probably running out of product. He's running out of people. And, and so he said, I've, I've got to do something here to expand this business. And I, it's very difficult to get over the mountains and things like that to other people. And so he began to create a mail order catalog. And that's how Ikea really, really started to step out. He started selling things. I'm not sure how he got those things or how all that process happened. But he started selling things through mail order catalog. And eventually... Um, obviously, you see the stores that we have now. And this, this poor young man at 17 years old is now worth $3.2 billion. He started with what he had. He started with something. And I would encourage you that you've got something. You've got something you can start with. And whenever, whenever you walk up to somebody and they've got a need, what do you have? Not, not can I fix the problem? Can I fix all their needs of their entire life? No, don't. don't don't worry about that. God didn't ask you to do that. He just said, what need can you fix right there for them? What can you give them? How can you help them? How can you bless them? How can you be uh, Jesus for them in their life? What do they need? Sometimes it's just a smile. It's nothing more than that. Sometimes it's calling somebody and, and you know they're going through a trouble. It's calling them and just saying, how's it going? And then you let them cry on your shoulder 
for an hour and a half and you don't even have to give them an answer. They just needed to know somebody was there. Sometimes God will give you an answer. Sometimes God will connect you. I love people that network. People that network, they're, they're always looking for a way to, to bring answers to other people. And, and so like, like you could find out that, that um, in, in the churches, you could find out that, that this church has this resource over there and that church has that one. And, and maybe you know about it. And so I connect those two churches together. It's, it's, maybe it's something like that. You're bringing answers by just networking people together. But don't be an island to yourself. Don't just live by yourself. Don't just, I, I've always mentioned it this way. Don't pull into your, your driveway and, and into your garage and then the door goes down before you get out of the car because you don't want to talk to your neighbors. People need Jesus. People need to see Jesus. And for many of them, they're not going to see it except through you and through I. I can't go to your workplace. Tina can't go to your workplace. Uh, many of us, we, we can't go where you work. We can't go where you're going to go shopping tomorrow night or, or whatever. You're the one. You're the, the, you're the ambassador. You're the one that needs to go and represent Jesus to the world. And, and all you have to do is smile. All you have to do is just get a little involved in somebody's life. It was a bold move. I'll be honest. I think it was a bold move for me to say, are you okay? Is everything all right? And I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I'm really glad that that happened. I'm really glad that I was faithful and stepped out and did that. And I pray to God that I'll continue that. What I've noticed in my own life is it isn't me. It's the more I'm filled, the more that bubbles out. You become less afraid of people. You become less afraid to ask that person that's crying. I mean, hey, the truth is that's scary. You don't know what you're walking into. I mean, I don't know what that guy needed. I don't know what was going on. I mean, he could have been crazy. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Guess what? He wasn't crazy. He's in need. He's hurting. And he just needed somebody to say, I'm there. And I hope and I pray that, that somehow he continues to work hard and, and God meets every need in his life and, and shows him. But I think the greatest thing that he needs, and, and, and folks, I, don't ask me why. I, I didn't feel like I was supposed to try to pray and lead him to the Lord right there at that moment. I did exactly what I felt like I was supposed to do. And he even told me, look, I got to get going. I got, I got to go. And so I did what I was supposed to do. And I'm just saying, sometimes it's small. But what do you have? What can you do? Why don't you guys stand up with me real quick? <laughs> Father, today, as we come before you, God, we're just in awe of all that you've done today. This has been a miraculous kind of day. It's just been awesome to, to watch the spirit flow and, and move during worship time and pray over the sick. God, to watch people's lives just come alive. And Father, I pray today, God, for those who feel like they don't have anything. God, that you would remind them that it just takes a little bit of oil. It just takes a little bit of this. It just takes a smile. It just takes you getting out of yourself. God, quicken us when we see something. Quicken us when we hear about a need. To run to that need, not to run away from that need. God, I pray that we would just get outside of our little man-made box that seems to be around each of us. Let down the walls. Begin to talk to a neighbor. Begin to talk to that person that isn't smiling at us at the store, that's having a rough day. I pray that we would just stop and pray for somebody. Give them a handshake. Give them a hug. I pray we wouldn't look at them and say, well, they stink, they smell, they, they look funny, they, they don't look like somebody that I would accept. God, I pray that we would get beyond that. And we would see Jesus, or we would see people as Jesus sees people. He went to the poor, he healed the sick, he, he healed the lame, he, he healed those who were unclean. He didn't let anything hold him back. He, he went and talked to the prostitutes. He went and talked to those who, who drink too much, who are outcasts in society. He was there for them. God, I just say that may, may we be more like Jesus and less like ourselves. May he increase and we decrease. Have your way in us, God. We need you so much. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.
Uh, Steve, are you still? You're back there. That's okay. Um, I'm not sure of all the announcements we've got. I know, I know a couple of things here. Um, yeah, number one, Wednesday prayer. We are having it this week. It's, gee whiz.